Come, people of the risen King, however you may, however many you may be, and come those of you at home watching. Come, people of the risen King. Yeah, we need to stand so we can sing out and hear each other. We might uh, there we go. yeah, let's do that. Wow, it's so good to see everyone this morning. We're so glad that you're here for our, our uh, we've guests who are with us. We're so thankful that you're able to be with us for our, for our people who have not been able to be with us since uh, December. Welcome back. We're so glad that you're here. Guests, welcome. We are so glad that you're here and worshiping with us this morning. Uh, welcome to worship. Uh, we... Uh, come together this morning to worship a God that is, is wonderful, a God who is uh, sovereign over all the things that are happening in the world, a God who is, is uh, 
loving, a God who is merciful, a God who is kind, and a God who desires our worship because he knows we're going to worship something. He knows we're going to worship something. We're either going to worship a creator or we're going to worship the creation. And so I'm so glad that you're here with us worshiping the creator this morning. I can't tell you how good it is to look out and see these faces. We've, um, as, uh, um, as you know, uh, we, were, we were going really good back in March, almost this time last year, and, and then we, we shut down as, as every church did, and, and then back in June, we started back with about 30, and, and we, we got going really good and, and up to December, and, and then COVID hit us as a church, and, and we had to shut down again, and, and then we started back in the 1st of February, and then the snowpocalypse hit. And so, in spite of all that, God is sovereign, and he is good, and we are here to worship that God. If you'll join me as we continue our worship and prayer, Father, you are a wonderful and mighty God. May your word, in song, your word, in, in read, your word, in uh, taught, your word, in prayer, may your word go out today in such a way that those who need to know you, who have, who have skirted around the issue of, putting their tr of repenting and putting their faith in you, God, I pray today would be that day that they would know you. Thank you, Father, for the gift of worship, that we can come together as, as a family of God, whether we've just met today or we've known each other all our lives. Thank you that we have that ability to come before your throne. And I thank you that you are the God who hears and answers our prayers. May all that we do glorify you. Thank you, Father, for the, the, the sound of children in our basement as they celebrate uh, Jesus loves me today. It's in that name above all names, the Jesus that loves me, that we pray. Amen and amen.
scripture reading this morning is from the 108th Psalm. My heart is confident, God. I will sing. I will sing praises with the whole of my being. Wake up, harp and lyre. I will wake up the dawn. I will praise you, Lord, among the peoples. I will sing praises to you among the nations. For your faithful love is higher than the heavens, and your faithfulness reaches to the clouds. God, be exalted above the heavens, and let your glory be over the whole earth.
you have your Bible with you, if you'll open it to Matthew chapter 7, beginning in verses 13, and we're going to read verses 13 and 14. Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, as we continue and actually wrapping up our journey through the Sermon on the Mount. And if you don't have your Bibles with you, it's on the screen up here up front. It's on the one in back too, but don't turn around that way. Um, Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14 read like this. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the road broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who go through it. How narrow is the gate and difficult the road that leads to life, and few find it. Father, I thank you that you have provided a way. And God, I pray for those who are on the wrong way. God, may your, thank you for your word, for your word is truth. May we, as, as your people, your disciples, see the way that we're on. And Father, I pray for those, especially for those who are on the wide way. May they see the narrow gate today. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. You know, as we said last week, we talked about this last week, every sermon has three parts. There is, there is the introduction and, and the body and the conclusion. Those are the three parts. Now, they tell us in preaching school that the introduction should grasp the attention of the hearer. So listen real close, okay? Okay, I got you. Have I got you? Good. I've done that. It should grasp the attention of the hearer, and, and so they want to hear what's about to be said. The body of the sermon is the teaching portion. It, it contains the primary teaching of the sermon. It's, it's in the body that the preacher should take the text of God's word and explain and interpret it and, and, and apply it to our lives using illustrations and, and uh, see, so that we can see how it applies to our lives. The conclusion of the sermon should help you answer the question, so what? The preacher's been up here for 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 40 minutes. You know, I listened to a sermon yesterday that was 75 minutes. That won't be me. In case you're worried, yes, don't worry about it. That won't be me. Um, but it should answer the question. The conclusion should answer the question, so what? There should always be an invitation to the sermon. Now, whether or not you, you do as I do and come down and we play music and have an open invitation, there should always be an invitation for transformation in the sermon. And that's where we are right now in the Sermon on the Mount. We are in the conclusion. We are beginning the conclusion of the Sermon on the Mount. He's conclude, Jesus is concluding the sermon with four choices that we must make. And he's, he's giving us this invitation of four choices that we must make. Um, we must choose between the narrow gate and the wide gate. We must choose between the bad fruit producers and the good fruit producers. We must choose between good profession of faith and a false profession of faith. We must choose between hearing what is said and walking away or hearing what is said and obeying. Now, we make choices every day. Some of our choices are inconsequential, like uh, what we're going to wear today. I got up this morning and I said, Annette, what should I wear? She said, I don't care. Wear something. And, and we tell people, you know, we're a come-as-you-are church. We don't care what you wear as long as you're wearing something when you come in these doors. And, um, but, I, but I had to go to my closet and look, and, 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 and you know, you've seen that uh, uh, Capital One commercial with, um, um, uh, gosh, I hate it when my brain just does that. I know exactly who I'm thinking about from Hendersonville. Used to be country. What's her name? Taylor Swift. And she's trying to figure out what she's going to wear today, and she opens her closet, and there's all these cardigans, and she says, I think I'll wear a cardigan. You know, my closet's not like that. I had to decide. I had to choose what I was going to wear. But that was inconsequential. If I had worn a different outfit, you guys wouldn't have cared. You probably wouldn't have even noticed. But some of our choices have a greater impact on our lives, like choosing to go out with that guy or that woman that eventually becomes our spouse. 
you know, the, the choice that Jesus puts in front of us today, these four choices all have eternal consequences. Jesus points out that with these choices, that there are only two choices. And today's passage puts two gates in front of us. And Jesus tells us to choose. Now let's take a look. To help us, he shows us what's behind those gates. And so let's take a look at those two gates and, and what's behind them and see, A, which gate we've gone through, and B, how we can get to the gate that Jesus would have us choose. Let's take a look. The first thing we see is that there are two entrances. He says, the gate is wide and the road is broad that leads to destruction. And the narrow is get that how narrow is the gate and difficult the road that leads to life. You see, we first have the wide gate. Now the wide gate or the broad gate is a gate that you entered at birth. We were born inside this gate. We we're born here. This is a gate, that, uh, the road that we're all on. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3 tells us that we're all on that path. We've all gone through that wide gate. It's, he explains our situation in the way of the wide gate. God, God's word says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you previously walked according to the ways of this world, according to the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit now working in the disobedient. We, too, all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts, and we were by nature children under wrath, as others were also. You see, he says that we are all, by nature, on inside this wide gate. The gate is the gate of self-gratification and disobedience. This is the gate that allows us to do what we want, when we want, without any regard for the consequences. This is the gate that opens easily for us and entices us to stay in it. This is the gate that we don't have to do anything to enter because we've all walked through it. This is the gate that leads to destruction. The good news is we can always choose the narrow gate. I read Robert Frost's um, uh, The Path Less Traveled um, poem, and he was talking about how he came to uh, uh, two paths, and he looked down one and he chose the other. And he says, thinking that I can always come back and choose this other one, but knowing that the way life goes, and I'm obviously paraphrasing, knowing that the way life goes, I probably won't. Well, that's not the way with the narrow gate. The narrow gate, you can choose. You can choose at any point. Because the, you don't, even if you're going down the wide path, the narrow gate is right here. It's right in front of you. It's always right in front of you for you to choose. No matter how far you go down the path from the wide gate, the choice of the narrow gate is always right there to choose. And Jesus is the narrow gate. He says in John chapter 10, verse 9, I am the gate. If anyone enters by me, will be saved. He will be saved. Unlike the wide gate, you must choose the narrow gate. Now, by default, we're inside the wide gate. You cannot, by default, go into the narrow gate. You will not, by default, enter into the narrow gate. It has to be by decision. It has to be a matter of the will. So how do you choose this gate? How do you go through this narrow gate? If you can choose to do it, how do you do it? Well, Jesus, in his very first sermon recorded in Mark chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, he tells us. He says, After John was arrested, Jesus went to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. Repent and believe the good news. Jesus tells us that we go through this gate by repentance and faith. Now, the word repentance literally means to turn away. But biblical repentance has so much more to it. It's, it's, it's much more colorful, if you will. 
has many more layers. It's in it, the first thing that biblical repentance of is an admission of sin. You know, too many people today in, in our world today don't believe in sin. You have your truth, I have my truth. You have your lifestyle, I have my lifestyle. You have your things that you like to do, I have my things that I like to do. And so, but there's no sin. Now, they might talk about sin when it comes to someone like um, uh, um, Adolf Hitler or, or uh, you know, Joe Stalin or, or, you know, Saddam Hussein or, or some of the other terrible people, you know, the, the John Wayne Gacy's and the serial killers. You know, we talk about those being sinful people, but we're all good people. If you listen to people in the world, they don't sin. They believe sin is a made-up concept, made up by Christians, so that they would feel guilty. All you have to do is listen to the Billy Joel song, Only the Good Die Young, where he says, I'd rather laugh with the sinners than cry with the saints. You know, that's the concept. But God defines sin. He defines sin as rebellion. We are all rebellious at some level. And to repent, we must acknowledge that we are in rebellion to God. We have, we have turned from God. And the Bible describes our, our relationship to God when we are not His children, when we are not repentant and believing in Him. You know how He describes your relationship to God? Enemies. Enemies to God. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be an enemy to God. God defines sin as rebellion. And so we have to admit that there is sin in our lives. There is rebellion in our lives. The second layer is there is a sorrow for that rebellion and that sin. We can't say, yeah, I'm rebellious, so what? I like my rebellious streak. That's, that's confessing that I'm rebellious, but it's not being sorrowful for it. We need to be like my daughter was when she was much younger. My daughter is 33 now. Um, oh, and by the way, about to have a baby in September. I'm, I'm, I'm sharing that a, two, a couple, three times because I want everybody to know. And no, we're not moving down there to Florida anytime soon. The house is not for sale. My resume is not out. Anyway, we, can't, we have to be like Krista was when she was young. Normally, Annette was home with her, and, and if Krista disobeyed, Annette just took care of it because she didn't want to be, you know, wait till Dad gets home and he'll take care of it. But she did something, I think, that hurt Annette's feelings. She said something to Annette. You know, she was four, but she said something that Annette said hurt her feelings. And uh, so instead of Annette uh, punishing her, she says, when Dad gets home, I'm going to tell him what you did. And, and he's going to handle this. And so I get home, and I'm sitting in my chair, and, and, and Annette tells me what Krista did. And then Krista comes crying. And she climbs up in my lap. And through tears... She says, Dad, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean, I, I know I did it. I didn't, I shouldn't have done it. I won't do it again. Well, she may have. But she was truly sorrowful at that point. And we must be like that when we repent. We have to have sorrow for our sin, for our rebellion. Repentance is also an asking forgiveness for sin. You know, once we've acknowledged our sin and sadness, and we must ask for forgiveness. And finally, it's a turning for sin from sin. Now, if I were, you know, many, uh, many abused women have heard their husbands who, ab who abused them say, I'm sorry, just before they abuse them again. We have to turn from that. We have to turn from that sin. 
We have to turn from that sin. And once we repent and turn from our sin, we turn to Christ in faith. Because, you see, he is the narrow gate. So there are two gates. There are two entrances, the the wide gate and the narrow gate. Once we enter, there are two paths. There's the easy path and the difficult path. Let's take a look at the easy path. This is the path of the world. It's wide because it accepts any way you choose to live. You can live good enough to get into heaven on this easy path. If you attend church, you will get to heaven on this easy path. Your parents were Christians so that you will get to heaven on this easy path. You were baptized, and that will get you to heaven on this easy path. You don't believe in heaven? That's okay. Heaven believes in you. You're in. You're Muslim, Buddhist, uh, atheist, agnostic. That's okay. You're in. It's easy. It's easy to get to heaven. There's nothing you have to do to stay on this path. It's like a river with a current, and and you're on on a, a raft or an inner tube, and you're just floating down, and it's just really easy to stay on this wide and easy path. But it doesn't lead to heaven. There's a difficult path that leads to heaven. There's a difficult path that leads to heaven. The difficult path is different. It is a narrow path. It is a narrow path. You know, it does it does matter what you believe and how you live. This path is narrow because God is narrow. Bodhi Bakum, whose 75-minute sermon I listened to on this, uh, said God can, can be narrow because God's not running for God. He can choose to be narrow. We can be, he is, he is narrow. How narrow is the way? It's the way through one person. That's how narrow it is. You have to go through one person. There is nobody who can walk on this path for you. You have to go through the one person. That one person is Jesus. Jesus himself said in John chapter 14, verse 1 through 6, he says, Don't let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms, and if it were not so, I would have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you. If I go away and prepare a place for you, I will come again to take you to myself so that where I am, you may be also. You know the way to where I am going. Lord Thomas said, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus in John chapter 14, verse 6 says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And no one comes to the Father but through me. It is a way that is through one person. Jesus is the way. Now, this is also the difficult path. It's not just narrow, it's difficult. Scripture tells us it is difficult. The word translated difficult or narrow can also be translated afflicted or persecuted. This is is the, the path where we will be persecuted. Jesus promised his disciples that they would be hated because he was hated. He will be called, we will be called narrow-minded because we don't accept the ideologies and the ideas that those are on the wide path accept so easily. Persecution is to be expected on this path. 2 Timothy 3.12 In fact, all who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. This is a difficult path. It's not easy. You can only go on this path through the strength of Jesus Christ. One of my favorite passages, and I pray this daily for people, is that where in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, I believe it is, where where Paul has this thorn in his flesh, and he's prayed three times that God would remove it. And, And Jesus says to him, 
My grace is sufficient for you, and my strength is made perfect in your weakness. And it's only in the sufficient grace and the perfect strength of Jesus Christ that we can make it on this path. This is not a path that we can do on our own. This is a path that we have to enter through Jesus and stay on in Jesus. Jesus tells us there are two crowds. There are two crowds. There's the many and the few. Let's take a look at the many. If you want to do your best life now, this is the crowd you want to be with. If you want to do, uh, their motto is, eat, drink, be merry, for tomorrow we die and there's nothing to be concerned about. If, if you ask them whether they even consider what's next after death, they will either tell you they don't believe in anything after death or I've never really considered it. I've never really thought about it. This is the crowd where everyone is loved and accepted and they are and as they are and there is no judgment. They are those who in this crowd who once claimed to have gone through the narrow gate and walked the difficult path, but now they have seen the error of their ways. There's a new word for that. It's called deconstructionism. It's called deconstructionism, where people say, you know, I used to believe in, in, in Jesus, but today, no, I don't. And many people have made the news in Christian circles uh, with, with, that, uh, with that statement, making that statement. Many people have, have made that statement, and, and they've fallen away. These people, however, were never really on the narrow path. They might have been walking beside it. They were either deceiving themselves or everybody else. Now, it's possible that they had been deceived. One of the greatest deceptions, and you'll never hear this, um, as long as I am pastor at this church, you will never hear this from this pulpit. So, if you want to know Jesus, won't you come forward? If you want to know Jesus, I want you to pray this prayer after me. Did you pray that prayer? Now, I, sinner's prayer has its place. I'm not dissing that. But here's the part. Did you pray that prayer? Yes. Did you mean it? Yes. Did you really, really mean it? Yes, I really, really meant it. Then you're saved. You'll never hear the proclamation, then you're saved, from anybody in this pulpit not more than once because they will never get the pulpit again as long as i'm here because it is not our job to tell someone they're saved it is the job of the holy spirit to tell them they're saved and so john first john 2 19 he john writes they went out from us but they were not of us for if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. You see, that's the many. That's the many. There's another crowd that Jesus calls the few that are on the straight, on the, on the narrow path, through the, on the difficult path, through the narrow gate. And Jesus said that the few would walk through the narrow gate and walk the difficult path, and these are his disciples. These people desire Jesus more than anything. These people don't judge either, and they know that Jesus accepts them just the way we are. But we also know that Jesus loves us enough not to leave us in sin. The few are those who endure with God's help. They endure sufferings with God's help. In Hebrews chapter 10, 32, it says, Remember the earlier days when after you had been enlightened, you endured hard struggle with, suffering, with sufferings. They endure God's discipline with his help. In Hebrews 12, 7, endure suffering as discipline. God is dealing with you as sons. For what son is there that a father does not discipline? They endure trials with God's help. James 1.12, blessed is the one who endures trials because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. And they endure until the end by God's grace. 
Matthew chapter 24, verse 13 says, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. That's not saying that we, we have to live and we can lose our salvation. That is saying those who endure to the end are the ones who have received salvation. There are two gates, two entrances. There are two paths. There are two crowds. There's two destinations. There are two destinations. The first destination is destruction. Now, before I talked about this wide path and how you can, you know, no matter what you believe, you can get to heaven. Well, here's the thing. That path doesn't lead to heaven. Jesus says that that path leads the road for the gate is wide and the road broad that leads to destruction. Don't be deceived. This wide gate and easy path that looks so tempting is leading to your destruction. This easy path that everybody is having so much fun on leads straight to hell. The path that has the footprints of many people we would call good leads to God's wrath. This is the wide gate. This is the wide path. This is the path that leads to destruction. But Jesus, in his grace and mercy, provided the narrow gate. He provided this, narrow, this difficult path that leads to life. The narrow gate leads to life. Remember, Jesus said, I am the gate. Jesus also said, I am the way. Jesus also said, I am the life. Jesus is pointing to himself. He is the narrow gate and the difficult path that leads to life. Jesus said that few will find that gate. Why will few find that gate? For the same reason that few criminals find a police station. They aren't looking for it. Jesus said, I have come so that they may have life and have it in abundance. This is the gate that you want, and that gate is so close, it's right in front of you. If you've not already gone through that gate. So we reach the conclusion of the sermon. So what? There is a choice to make. Which choice do you make? Do you stay on the easy path? Do you stay on this path where I'm doing this, I'm, I'm just going to decide to make, do this my own way. I'm going to put my trust in my church. I'm going to put my trust in my baptism. I'm going to put my trust in my good works. I'm going to put my trust in my family. I'm going to put my trust in, in all the things that I think will get me to heaven. Or are you going to choose the narrow gate that is Jesus Christ and put your trust in him? Let me tell you what Jesus would have you do. The very first words in verse 13, enter through the narrow gate. There are two choices. God through Moses in Deuteronomy says, I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Choose life so that you and your descendants may live. Now, whether you're watching on Facebook or YouTube or, or sitting here, some of you are on the wide and easy. And we pray for you every Wednesday by name that you would see and come through the narrow gate by repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. Choose today who you will serve from this day forward. Will you serve Jesus or yourself? I urge you to come to Jesus. It's been put before you, the way of life and death and blessing and curse. I urge you to choose life. Won't you come? Pray with me. Father, I pray as we come to this time of commitment, I pray for those that are sitting here, those who are watching live, those who are watching 
at whatever time they're watching, that right now that your Holy Spirit is working in their hearts, drawing them to the narrow gate that is your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, be glorified in this. Lord, you are a great God, and we love you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. As we stand and sing, come as you are, won't you come? and strength today taste the living water and never thirst again come just as you are hear the spirit Alice, if you'll come here beside me. Fred and Alice Stevens have uh, uh, moved up here from Georgia a, a few months ago and almost immediately started attending with us. And, and they told me last week that they wanted to uh, uh, come and be members of our church. They've told me their testimonies of, of uh, I especially love Fred's testimony of being saved. He was at work at the Ford plant in, in, Atlanta. in Atlanta, and he told his boss, I got to go. And he hitchhiked 40 miles to call the pastor to come and tell him how to, how to receive Jesus. And so they come to join, uh, unite with us uh, on letter from, Griff, from uh, Southside Baptist Church in Griffin, Georgia. And if you're excited like I am, say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. All right. If you'll go ahead and have a seat there, we're going to let people come around and fist bump you and do whatever it is we do these days in this COVID world. If you'll have a seat, I want to share with you some things that are happening in the life of our church. Uh, the first thing I want to share with you is Sunday school. It starts, it resumes, it, we, it, we reset it. We're doing another reset on our Sunday school next Sunday, 945. Uh, adults will meet you know, in the in the fellowship hall where you've been meeting children and youth uh, will meet at different classes if you don't know where to meet there will be someone who will meet you and greet you and let you know exactly where your class is our the uh, teachers should have their books um, our uh, student books for the adults are in the back if you want to go get one uh, and if you want an open windows those are back there also Sunday school restarts. Yes, there will be coffee and donuts and juice and all those things that we feel like we have to have to get us going in the morning. And so we'll get you all sweetened up uh, and caf caffeinated so that way if my preaching puts you to sleep. 
Bible study and prayer, Wednesday nights, we're continuing that by Zoom for a few weeks. Uh, after we get Sunday school going, then we'll get our Wednesday nights going. But uh, Bible study and prayer via Zoom uh, is continuing on Wednesday nights at 6.30. I will send out a, a Zoom link to everybody who is on our um, uh, uh, text text notification list if you would like to be a part of that and you're not uh, if you will just let me know we'll put you on the text notification list what's next rise up for those of you who had to climb the stairs and some of some of you the climbing for some of our people climbing the stairs is not an option they have to go around the building and so we have felt we have uh, since God leading us to put an elevator a lift actually in the in the back area back here and uh, uh, the total cost is sixty thousand dollars we're looking to raise 30 of that by uh, July 1 we're seventy three hundred and fifty dollars uh, or 24 percent of the way there we do invite you to to give especially members uh, sacrificially to this uh, and uh, I will not be saying this every time but as we're, we're rebooting, uh, I will do this every week. Uh, probably next week is the last time I'll do it uh, other than the first week, but we'll always have it on the screen, on the slide. And that's it. Okay, there's one more we're continuing to take up for the food bank in Jellicoe, Tennessee. As a matter of fact, I was just told that we're going to need to make a delivery there in the near future. So uh, if you want to donate... We have ways of giving. You can give online. You can give. There are envelopes, uh, and uh, you can put them in. the. We're not passing the plate, so you can put them in the plate as you go out. Um, the uh, Just put on there Jellico or, uh, Jellico or Rise Up or Elevator if you want to give to one of those two special, special uh, things. Thank you for being here. Guests, we're so thankful that you came and worshiped with us this morning. Um, we know that uh, there are a lot of churches out there, and uh, we, we hope and pray that you were blessed uh, this morning by our worship and, and by the message, uh, and uh, uh, we're just thankful that you're here. For those who of our members and, and uh, regular attenders, thank you for being here. Thank you for being helping reboot our, our attendance. Uh, I hope next week to be able to make an exciting announcement about Easter. Uh, so uh, that's, uh, I hope to be able to do that. So hang in there. Come back, be with us uh, next week. If you'll stand. Glenn Brown, would you uh, close us in prayer?